Happy Wednesday. Welcome into the CHGO Blackhawks podcast. I'm Jay Zawoski with Greg Boyson and Mario Tirabasi. Later in the show, we're going to be joined by EP Ringside's Sean Shapiro and future Oscar nominee. Yes. Sean Shapiro. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about the new movie, The Late Game, and talk about some uh, upcoming NHL prospects, especially as we approach the NHL draft here. The Hawks currently in the position with the second best odds. And number one, so we'll talk some prospects there. But before Sean arrives, we've got the NCAA hockey tournament starting tomorrow. We've got uh, junior league playoffs starting, and we've got a bunch of Hawks involved. Let's start there, fellas. How about the rebuild report, fellas? Do their thing. Yes, the rebuild report. Here's this is this is basically what tomorrow's rebuild report is going to be. Can about. you just run like a, a transcription on this, and then we'll just yeah. publish it yeah, later? So you're saying I don't have to write this tomorrow? Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, NCAA tournament time is here. We have the uh, the 16 teams that make up the NCAA hockey tournament, not the basketball one, but the hockey one. Um, top seeds, number one, Boston College. Number two, Boston University. Don't get those two confused. Uh, number three, Denver University. And number four, Michigan State. Game starting tomorrow. There's a number of Blackhawks prospects in the tournament um, that you should definitely be excited about and one that is also there. Uh, Liam Gorman with UMass. He was uh, acquired, I think that was the 2022 Draft. He was uh, acquired in a uh, trade with, I think it was Pittsburgh. Can't remember wh- uh, what, but um, he's a he's a longtime college player. Um, nice kid, tries hard, loves the game. Uh, then you got Nor- uh, Michigan taking on North Dakota. That game is Friday night. Uh, that's where Frank Nazar is playing this season uh, with Michigan. Had a great season uh, after missing most of last year with uh, an injury that required surgery came back last year uh, towards the uh, this time of the year last year played the last few games played through the Big Ten tournament was like really good for coming back from injury and then this season 38 points in 37 games he had two goals uh, for Michigan in the Big Ten tournament championship game against Michigan State uh, which they lost in overtime but he has been uh, as advertised uh, this season with 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 Michigan Needed to have a big bounce back season, and he did. Uh, played top line, uh, top six minutes. Played at center. Uh, played in all situations. And look, like you know, I know a lot of people I saw randomly last week were like, "I don't know about this Frank Nazar kid. Point per game in college is nothing to be excited about." I'm like, that blew my mind how how ignorant that that is uh, to to say. And and look, Nazar is a guy he played uh top minutes he's a top offensive guy his his speed is one of his best attributes um but he is so effective with and without the puck at the college game that it it really is impressive that he can be a point per game guy and still have games where he doesn't produce a point doesn't have a goal or an assist and he can be one of the most effective players for michigan and we've we've seen that a number of times this season saw it in the big 10 uh tournament games um, I mean, he is, he's a guy who has started to kind of like already at this level, like kind of get around, round out his game a little bit, get some more uh, off the puck things working for him. Defensively, he's working harder uh, this year. So I'm really excited for him. He's got a tough, him and Michigan have a tough matchup uh, Friday night against North Dakota. Uh, they are in the same region as uh, Western Michigan and Michigan State. So potentially... Uh, in the in the next round, you could see a Michigan Michigan State rematch, which I think would be uh, pretty exciting, and that would put uh, him up against uh, Artem Levshinov, one of the top prospects uh, in this year's draft uh, at Mich- defenseman at Michigan State. 
then uh, taking on UMass is number three seed Denver. That game is tomorrow afternoon, early afternoon game, uh, one o'clock central time start. Uh, that's Aiden Thompson. Uh, he's a guy that I think doesn't get a lot of recognition. I know there's a lot of headline grabbers with Moore and Nazar and Renzel this year. Uh, but Aiden Thompson has had a, a tremendous season. Denver, he, he wasn't one of Denver's top point producers, but he's another one of those guys where he can be effective without the puck. And uh, he was a bit of a streaky scorer this year, but towards the end of this season, started producing a little bit more, was a big factor for them through the uh, NCHC uh, conference tournament, which they won. Um, he's going to be a, a guy to uh, keep an eye on. He's in his second year of, of, of school, I think there's a higher likelihood he goes back for a third year, uh, and then we talk about the jump there. But I also wouldn't be surprised if maybe you know the Blackhawks feel like he's at that point where two years two years of college development has been enough, uh, and he might might make the jump this year. We'll have to keep an eye on that. Well, let, let me interrupt you real quick uh, and and with Nazar because I think there's a lot of fans who maybe don't watch college hockey like religiously and. They want to know, like, if Michigan loses, does that mean that Frank Nazar could join the Hawks this year? It could, yeah. and I and I think where I think where the Blackhawks have left it is that they, from 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 what I understand, it's it's kind of like what he wants to do. I think their their assessment of him uh, has been that he's he's done the things that that they've wanted to see from him. He's at the point in his development where I think they think he's ready to to try and maybe make that next step um so if he wants to do that if he wants to uh play the last week of this season week and a half of this season uh in the nhl burn the first year of his of his uh entry level deal uh by playing that week and a half like i think that that might be something that's up to him but if he were to lose uh against north dakota on uh on, on friday night yeah i mean he's got what 11 days before the end of the season, 12 days, something like that. So there could be that, that window for him to, uh, to, to jump over and, and sign and, and play out the rest of the season with the Blackhawks. But I wonder if maybe it comes down to you've, you've, you've played a full season coming off of an injury. You played at World Juniors. Maybe that's enough hockey for yeah, you this year. And then we, you know, we go into next summer with, uh, with more of a, a runway. Yeah, that would probably be the way. Because uh, say they lose Friday. You get them here when they come, you know, they're on a road trip right now. Yeah. So you probably wouldn't even get them with the team until next week, you know. And then you're already into April. And you have seven games left after yeah. this three-game home. Is it worth well, burning? I mean, yeah. obviously burning it's a not year unheard doesn't. Of, but right. Yeah. Burning a year of obviously we've seen it with Lucas Reichel, you know, they're, they're, we've seen it this year with Kevin Korchinski. They're not too concerned about that. Slaggart. Mm -hmm. um, well, Slaggart was by age. Oh right. Yeah, he had the he couldn't sign a three year deal, but yeah, they're burn they're essentially burning a year mm -hmm. to get him up here to play. But yeah, you might you know coming off a, a, a serious injury and and you know maybe they say. But I mean, if he they put him this year, then that puts him on the same timeline for needing a new deal with Bedard and Korchinski. So maybe they say, "Hey." Well, no. If he were if he were to sign a two year deal, well, it would be a three year deal. Is it three? Is for, he in that age range? Yeah, okay, it's under twenty or under twenty one is a three year. Gotcha. Deal. Yeah. So it'd be a three year deal, burning this year. So he'd then be on the same. Yeah. Not so that that's like the end of the world, but. They may want to stagger. That's a that's a couple bit. guys that you're thinking. Those are you're three thinking. guys that if everything goes right, you're going to give them substantial pay raises in the mm -hmm. same year. So you may say, yeah. Hey. I mean, I think though, the only, you know that Bedard's next deal is going to be massive. Like that's a given. That's going to be max length, huge yeah, money. It's going to be a big investment. And you know that, you know, at the end of that eight years, he's probably going to be a bit of a bargain. Um, Korchinski. And Nazar, we expect them to be good players by then, but I don't think they're going to be bank breakers in that second deal. It's probably those probably two guys or third deals will be those where they really cash out. Yeah, those guys could line up to be those like 
you know, three and four year deals rather than the yeah. six and seven and eight year deals kind of thing. I'm, I, uh, you know, I'm really interested. We talked about it last night. I'm really interested to see what they do with Alex Vlasic. Like, are they going to do a long term deal with him or are they going to bridge him? Like, I, I, I would do more of the long term investment, but I think that deal could set up what you know, might expect for some of those guys uh, that we're talking about here, like what, what their deals might end up looking like. But yeah, I mean, <sighs> And I, if, if if you saw it, I think it was Frank Saravalli, uh wrote about it uh, the last, uh, in, I think it was yesterday, how, you know, you get into the, the weeds of things, but like with the revenue and the escrow and, and, and all of that, next year's salary cap is gone, is going to go up a little bit, but there's potential that it, if I understand it correctly, there's potential that in the next year, you're not going to see it a one to two million dollar jump it's going to be like more substantial so that's that would then line up with that year where the blackhawks are going to have potentially nazar korchinski and and bedard all up at the same time um and then you look at contract coming off the books like you know there's there's a lot of money that's uh, available now and that's also going to be uh available to them down the road so i i wouldn't worry a whole lot about that right now that's that's next year's problem yeah for sure um sorry to derail you you had a lot going on there that's and i fine. just i wanted to make sure because i think there there's a pretty decent faction of fans that are like they keep an eye on the college game but aren't sure exactly how it works yeah i know nazar is probably top of mind for 99 percent of hawks fans when it comes to prospects and what's uh what's top of your mind when it comes to uh daily fantasy well it's obviously prize picks Duh. it's the largest daily fantasy sports platform in north america that's why They are the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's just you against the numbers instead of betting against thousands, battling, sorry, not betting, battling against thousands of other players, including pros and sharks. All you got to do is pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and just watch the winnings roll in. Be a part of the action on prize picks for both the men's and women's college basketball uh, tournaments. We're down to the Sweet 16 in the men's tournament. I think the women's tournament is also at that point, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Uh, So getting down to the the Sweet 16, make sure you are on prize picks, uh, making the most of the final uh, games of the college basketball season. And right now, you can win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000 with NBA, NHL, and college basketball entries Oof. today on prize picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. So what you want to do is head to prizepicks.com slash CHGO. Use the code CHGO, and, you're gonna, uh, and you can get up to $100 in a first deposit match. Again, that's prizepicks.com slash CHGO, and use the code CHGO. Pick more, pick less. It's just that easy. And when you're celebrating your big day over a prize picks, you can crack open a nice cold Coors Light, mm-hmm. sit back, and chill out, enjoy the chill. winnings, and just come down after that high of winning that game and chill yeah. out. That is the beer we go to when we're looking for those moments to chill and covering the Blackhawks. We need them a lot. Yeah. A lot. Mm-hmm. A real lot. An awful lot. A lot. Great stuff. Uh, we had a bunch hey, of it every once in a while at our uh, at our crossroads uh, pre takeover show yesterday. The Coors Light was flowing. Everybody was in a great mood to have a great time over at the United Center because they were chilling out with Coors Light. And when those mountains turn blue, you know your Coors Light is as cold as the Rockies. Coors Light is cold lagered, cold filtered, and cold packaged for a smoother finish. When it's time to chill, open a Coors Light. It's mountain cold refreshment, crisp and refreshing. As the Colorado Rockies, when it's time to chill, Coors Light is the beer we here at CHGO reach for. Get Coors Light delivered straight to your door with Instacart by going to CoorsLight.com slash CHGO Hockey. That's CoorsLight.com slash CHGO Hockey. Celebrate responsibly, Coors Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. And speaking of responsibility, I have failed in my job of reminding you all to do your job and smash that like button on the YouTube page. Please do that for us right now. Let's get those likes spiked and make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube page as well. And if you're listening on the podcast, we love you too. Make sure you're following or subscribe there and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And Laura, are we ready to welcome our guest to the show? All right. 
Sean Shapiro is here with us from EP Ringside, uh, actor in the last game, available now on Amazon Prime for to rent or buy. Sean, thanks for being with us, man. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was gonna tell you that's probably you know that might not work out, but I, I'll let you yeah. find that out on your own. But it's all right. It's all worked. It was out okay. Good. It works. We made it. We made it. Yeah. So awesome. Well, you're in town because mm-hmm. uh, you guys are doing a big screening of yep. uh, of the movie this weekend. So let our yeah. audience know where they can get tickets for that. Yeah. So we're doing uh, the late game. We're doing a uh, we're calling them watch parties because we think that's trendy and makes it <laughs> more people buy tickets. If I'm being truthfully honest on there. Heard of those and, before. And, yep. We uh, do those a lot. So, yep, so we're doing one at uh, we're doing one at four o'clock on Saturday at the Pickwick Theater. We've got uh, the we're get the, we'll be doing the movie at four. We've got a couple people coming in from the for who are in the movie. Myself, uh, my buddy uh, Tyler Durham's here with us. He's in the movie. He's in here already. We've got both the executive uh, producer, uh, Jeffrey Zucker, will be there. Jeff Tyner, the writer and director. Um, we've also got Zach Bell, who's in it, will be there. And uh, also R.A. Will from Spitting Chicklets will be in town for it as well. And we're doing that. And then in addition to that, if you kind of want to watch hockey and get the <laughs> and, and get the movie experience, we've set something up with the Wolves where we're doing something where if you buy, a, there's a ticket package. If you go to lategame.com slash Chicago right now, you can get a $30 ticket to the Wolves game either for tonight or Friday. And you also get an entry into the watch party on Saturday. So where I think this is the, we did our first kind of, cast and family screening in Charleston, South Carolina, where we filmed the movie. We did a first public one in uh, New York slash New Jersey, since we can combine those in one-to-one terminology now, (laughs) since everyone does. And then uh, about two weeks ago, we did one in Minnesota. So about fourth place, we've watched the movie, brought it live. So we're excited to have it in Chicago and, A, bring it around to actual hockey, some hockey stuff with, uh, with the Wolves games. And it works well since they're playing the, they're playing Rockford tonight. So I know the Hawks are on the road, but there's a, actual Hawks tie to the Wolves game tonight too so <laughs> yeah yeah well I mean they play each other 16 times yeah. a year it seems like so uh yeah good time for that to, to line up so you know the late game it is uh you know it's about a guy getting back into to playing you know some some beer league hockey uh something that a, a lot of a lot of people within you know hockey fandom uh also you know play play the sport and stuff so what went into the thought of 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 making this this film is it more? Is it to connect with those those fans, or is it to kind of be like, hey, like this is this is a little bit more of the like everyday uh, yeah. culture of hockey? Yeah, I think it's 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 kind of two pronged. The first one is it was there's not many great hockey movies. Just to be just to be blunt about it, right? Like you go through, you start to make your list of your best hockey movies, and you can probably name four or five, and then after that, it's and and all of them. The hockey itself, let's be honest, aside from Miracle, the hockey's not really that accurate. Right. And so um, my good buddy Jeff Tyner, the one who wrote and directed this, when he made this movie, one of his kind of dreams and his long-term visions were here is like, let's shoot a movie where the hockey actually looks accurate to what it is. It's not... It's not where it's not a, it's not a pro game. It's not a kids movie. When essentially, right? Every hockey movie has been made for it's either oh it's, it's minor league hockey or this is the first one that's made where most of us this is where we end up playing hockey. We end mm-hmm. up playing beer league. That's 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 where it is. And so that's kind of the audience it was made for. And it was it started really where um, Jeff tells the story much better than I because he's the one who wrote it. But basically, it was during COVID. He had just moved to the Denver area. And he had always wanted to kind of write a hockey script. And it basically, he was kind of in a rut where he was new to an area and subbed for a hockey team. And so kind of the script is kind of a little bit pretty much inspired kind of off real life for him, where that's kind of how he started growing a community and getting to know people. And so it's a hockey movie, but it's more of a adult friendship <laughs> movie where yeah, it's like, yeah. like as, yeah. as adults, it's really, it's really weird and hard to actually make friends as adults. Like we've talked to people, uh, Tyler, when we were riding over here was selling, we did a, we, uh, they did an event down at the, uh, sing Rays game down in Charleston this past weekend. And there's people who say, Oh, this, this reminds me of what it's like for my uh, uh, men's basketball team. I talked to a guy the other day who mentioned that. So it's kind of, it is a hockey movie, but we also feel like if you've pl- ever tried to play adult sports or make a friend after the age of 22 in your entire <laughs> life, yes. it, it applies to you. So. Yeah. I think too, the message of 
you know, you're, it's never really, I think we've all had our sport, our past sports glory when we were in high school or grade school. And just the thought of getting back into it is kind of scary and you oh, don't yeah. want to embarrass yeah. yourself. And the main character of the movie, Riley was just sort of saying like a, a recurring theme was, I just want to go embarrass myself. I don't want to embarrass myself when really everyone's kind of in the same boat. Yeah. And I think as the movie goes on, you kind of see that realization of, all right, like I belong here as much yeah, as yeah, anybody yeah. else does, you know? Yeah. And it's kind of funny. Cause that was, it was how the movie kind of worked in the filming process. It kind of played out that way pretty similarly. Cause so, when we're casting this movie, most of the people in the movie were, we all knew each other or had a close friendship slightly before. Now, I was, I'm good friends with the director, um, and I play the goalie in the movie, but then a bunch of the other guys are people he played with growing up down in the Charleston area. So we all kind of knew each other and everything like that, but we needed an actual real actor to, to, <laughs> actually, to, actually, to actually carry this because so it was the, we had these guys who played beer league hockey, who had experience playing beer league hockey, but you need someone who actually could act. And that's how, um, that's where Alec came in who played Riley. And so it was kind of funny that behind the scenes, part of it was very similar where he comes in, and is dealing with these guys who have all known each other for most of their lives or have these connections. And he's the new guy who's actually good at acting. And <laughs> it was over the, we shot it for about 14, 15 days down in Charleston. And it was kind of funny to see kind of over the course of shooting, he becomes part of the group. And he's actually one of the guys, he's flying in on Friday as well to, to be here for the Wolves game Friday and he'll be at the game Saturday. And it was kind of funny to see life imitate the movie unintentionally on the backside <laughs> of it because that's 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 how it works, I yep. guess. <laughs> now, I I will say you mentioned about the the, the action in the game. I, I I just got back into playing you know rec league hockey and stuff, and just watching the movie, watching the action in the game, I was just like, I feel like I'm playing. Like it, it how was that for filming that? Because I know in like yeah. you know like you said like in, in Miracle or like yeah. all those movies, like it's very like you they script how they're gonna move and stuff. Did you guys just go out and play and have a camera and just? Kind of like we we had to do that. That was that the way. so a we our budget was not massive. I mean, it's making a movie is expensive, but sure. it was still not. Um, so the original movie itself, the original script. Like I remember when we were doing reads originally, Jeff had written in all these like poetically beautiful hockey plays and everything <laughs> like that. And literally day one, we we're trying to script these, and like this is impossible because this, this, <laughs> this is this is impossible to script because you need to get four to five different angles of every yeah. single shot. And you need to get everyone's different coverage and everything like that. And so a lot of there are a couple things that did stay in the script, a couple couple parts of it and everything, but a lot of it just became okay. We're gonna we're gonna set it up and we're just gonna play. We're just gonna put the we're just gonna put the puck in and we're gonna play. It would be like okay, hey, this is gonna be an offensive zone face off for the young Genos. They're gonna win the draw and guys just play and see mm -hmm. what happens. And we did that and we had the uh, we had the camera going and it was kind of funny. One of the things we learned in doing this because uh, our Jeff, oh, there's three Jeffs on this project. It's kind of funny. <laughs> there's Jeff Tyner, who's the director and writer. There's, there's Jeffrey M. Zucker, who's the executive producer. And then our director of photography was named Jeff Van Gerwen, who we just call Finn. So it was with all the Jeffs. And they, uh, they actually met with the, one, of the director, one, of the, one of the people who worked on the director of photography with Miracle. And, kind of, and so one of the things we kind of semi-stole from Miracle was our, uh, our rig for how to film it where basically we kind of built it and it was, it's a camera and it's got, it's had about 15 to 20 like pucks on the bottom. And that's like, that's how it kind of, that's how we were able to get the dolly moving like the ice dolly. So there was part of it where we had, um, there was some shooting where the, there is actually a camera guy skating, holding the camera, but a lot of it is our director of photography on this dolly that's being pushed because pucks are making it go that we basically, uh, sprayed whatever i can't remember what it was but whatever the lubricant was to make it go faster and then so there was that and then there was also some shots we did with the drone that you can kind of see in there where you can tell where it's that's that's it but that was one of the things that i think is one of the coolest things about this movie where you're in it is you're like okay this is this is not this to me doesn't look like they went and pretended that it's real hockey, right? Yeah. Like there's a couple, there's a couple silly moments, but the hockey itself is, it's pretty good. I'd like to think so. Yeah. yeah. It, it felt very true to what a, what a beer league game would yeah. feel like. The most realistic cinematic hockey since sudden death with Claude Van Jean. <laughs> 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 that's on my list of that great is, hockey movies. That is, that's, <laughs> I mean, we almost, it felt like we had the live, uh, 
life, a uh, kind of real life plot of that recently, right? With the whole Yager bobble. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, yeah, right, 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 like right. I felt that was the bit. At some point, we were gonna have like. Uh, <laughs> it felt like that was coming, didn't it? Like this is yeah. this is a promotion. This didn't actually. And Dam's not doing anything these days. Why didn't they get yeah. him? Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. yeah. No, I think too, just capturing the the element of the game too, where. The you know, one of the early scenes in the movie is Riley arrives. He decides in his car he's going to try to play, yeah. and he's walking through a rink with maybe four people in it. And he opens one locker door <laughs> and it's locked, and the next one's locked. Then he opens the third yeah. one to a bunch of dongs. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Not, and he's like, yeah. "Why am I here?" Yeah. You know, it just it really captures the feel of the loneliness of mm-hmm. a league of that level. You're playing at 11 p.m. You yeah. can't find anyone oh, yeah. to even show up. It's I think that's a part of hockey that is so unique. You know, you can always find people to, hey, Sunday, let's go play 16-inch softball in Chicago or 12-inch in the rest of the country, whatever. You can find people to do that. There's very little commitment involved. But the hockey thing, and I think the other part of it, too, is, like, hockey culture is – bus and chops is such a big part of it. Yeah. You know, and I think that's why there's a lot of – some people have a lot of fear about, like, really getting into it or starting it because – I don't want to be the the guy on the team that sucks and is the is the punchline for everything. Yeah, I just think the movie did a really good job of capturing all of that, but then kind of reminding people too that with that bust chopping that comes with hockey is also a a camaraderie that can't be beaten either. Because if, if you can, I can talk shit about my guy, but you can't talk shit about my guy. There's that sort of an element to yeah. it too. It's a lot of the right. It's. You once it's kind of like the ultimate sign of respect in a hockey locker room, right? Is when you're actually being given shit, right? Like right. it's the like it's the when you when you're the one when you're actually getting it, then then you know like okay, I'm in. Like because yeah. it's kind of the it's it's the that's that's the that's the space, right? Um, and that was kind of one of those things that I think Jeff did a really good job of working into the story and, and everything like that. And it's it's. I really, I'm excited that people have seen it and they've actually had that reaction because that was one of those things where you see that you see it the first time and you've worked on something so closely and you're like, I think it's good, but until you <laughs> see other people get that, you're like, okay, yeah, we actually did it. <laughs> so right. Well, can we talk some prospects? With oh, you? of course, yes, of awesome. Course. Before we take yes. a break, remind people one more time how to get the tickets to the Wolves game in mm-hmm. the uh, in the movie tomorrow. Yeah, of course. So the uh, you can go to the Wolves game either tonight or Friday. We've got a ticket package with the Wolves. It's thirty bucks. You get a, t- a lower bowl ticket to the Wolves game. You get a ticket to the watch party on Saturday. You go to the lategame dot com uh, backslash Chicago. Um, you can check that out there. And if you can't make it to the watch party, you can also go to just the lategame dot com and you can stream it on on, on Prime Video right now if you want to watch it tonight right now so yeah check it out the late game the, we enjoyed the, it yesterday uh, yeah. pickwick theater is is awesome yeah it's uh historic yes i have many many movies there as a child with my grandma so yeah. it's it's uh, old school as they get awesome mm-hmm. awesome venue should be a good time and uh you know what else is awesome is uh saving a ton of money on your next vehicle purchase and the best offers of the year are during the march radness sales event Make your way to Ray Chevrolet on Route 12 in Fox Lake and join in on the sh- sh- ugh, savings. Whoa. Long <laughs> read. That too. <laughs> we were out late last night. One of the top-selling Chevy dealers in the Midwest, you'll always be able to shop. One of Chicagoland's largest Chevy inventories, they've got the perfect tailgate vehicle at Ray Chevy. During truck month for a limited time, they're offering 0% financing for 72 months on all brand-new Silverados with over 100 available Lots to choose from, and they also have 125 vehicles under $20,000. I don't think pricing has ever been more affordable than it is right now, and everybody loves the word free, and that's what you're going to get this month at Ray Chevrolet and Fox Lake. A free oil change. All you need to do is mention CHGO and scheduling your oil change. Start the spring off right and schedule it by April 1st. Visit Ray Chevrolet in Fox Lake or RayChevrolet.com. They've been serving the community since 1963. Find new roads. Free is wonderful. We all love free, but almost, if it can't be free, almost morph that into the uh, manscaped. Ad. You almost. Yeah, you're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> but if if it can't be free, you want to know how much it costs. Exactly. You don't need yes. surprises. You don't need twists and turns. And at CD One Price Cleaners, that's exactly what you get. With their low prices, customers can save over 30% on their dry cleaning bill by switching to CD1 price cleaners. They've got simple and transparent service. Other cleaners charge a different price for every garment type, plus they have upcharges, and you may pay a different price each time you visit. It's CD1 price cleaners. They charge one low price for any garment. Yep, even stinky nacho cheese stained sports jerseys, the same low price. They've got fast turnaround and text alerts. They will let you know 
when your order is ready for pickup. Because let's be honest, fellas, we drop off our clothes. Two days later, I forget they exist. They offer dry cleaning. They wash and fold your laundry. They'll clean your blankets and comforters. They've got tailoring and alterations. Leather cleaning, area rug cleaning. Got to get my chaps cleaned. Uh, visit chgo.cdone.com or check the link in our description. Once you're there, you can pick from an in-store coupon or online pickup and delivery coupon options. Again, that's chgo.cdone.com or click that link in our description. So, Sean, for those of you that don't know, you should know by now, writes for EP, Elite Prospects, EP Ringside, and with the Hawks in a rebuild, it is honestly, I think of all the hockey sites I go to, it's probably the one I go to the most because mm-hmm. it is very difficult to find any information on hockey prospects around the world, around the country. EP is the place to get it. So subscribe there. You're going to find everything you need to know. We are, with even with Connor Bedard, the Hawks, as you know, mm-hmm. still, we call this year one yep. of the rebuild. Uh, right now, sort of slotted to with the second best odds at number one. So let's say they don't get Macklin Celebrini. Yeah. Who are uh, two or three of the guys you really love for the Blackhawks in that second or third spot? Yeah. Um, now I'm a big believer. I, I know that there's there's Demidov, the, the Russian kid, and obviously he's a, everyone talks about him. I'm also a big believer. Personally, I only really like to talk more about guys I've seen in person sure. sometimes. So I know Demidov is definitely, and I've talked to our other guys at EP who have seen him, and they're, they think he's a stud. And it's to me, though – I look at kind of that top three area a kid who I've seen quite play quite a bit at Michigan State. May have saw him play in the Big Ten title game this pack this past weekend. Uh, Artem Lashenyov, who's a Belarusian kid, who honestly the only reason he went the college hockey route was because you remember with the Russia Ukraine stuff and everything, the Russians and Belarusians were kind of limited from being able to go to the CHL. So he ended up going to Michigan State, and he was 17 for a good part of the season. He's been by far one of the best defensemen in the Big Ten, and he's going to be a guy who, if you're kind of in that 2-3 range, like I think he's – and you look at the Blackhawks, right? You look at where you, you have Bedard. You already you have your number one center. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kind of your long-term plan right now is you're going to be – you kind of look at those building blocks for a contender. Okay, You need your number one center. You have that. You're going to need your goaltender at some point. You're going to need your defenseman. To me, um, Lefchenov is he's that guy who can be that kind of number one defenseman right there. Um, there's other defensemen that will kind of go in the top 10 that are really fascinating to me. Um, I lo- Now, they're going to probably drop a little. Wow. They're not going to go in that top five. I mean, so this it might not even be where Chicago's picking, but I think in this draft, you look at a Dickinson, not Jason Dickinson, a different, <laughs> different Dickinson, uh, who's in the OHL right now. You've got the uh, – in. Uh, uh, Zane Parekh with Saginaw right now is probably should go seven or eight. Like he is a, he's fun to watch. I'm planning to go watch him next next week in their, their first round series against Owen Sound. There's a lot of really good defensemen in this draft, and um, it's. But to me, I think Lefchenyov has all those tools and the timeline to fit really well mm-hmm. with the uh, with, with with the Hawks rebuild right now. Well, I think yeah. I, I think this this year's draft class compared to last year's where it was like. Every, everything for what the Blackhawks were trying to do was to get number one, get Bedard, mm-hmm. because yeah. I think last year's, like, the space between Bedard and the rest of the class seemed like it was so wide open. And this year it seems like there's a little bit less of that gap between uh, Celebrini and, and the, the rest of the field. Um, so is, is, is that underselling Celebrini, or is that... Would that be more of that this this class has maybe a little bit more at the top end, kind of like a spread of the wealth? I, so I think to say. it's. I think it's on, at the end of the day. I think part of it is just more reflective. That's how good Connor Bedard is. I think that's. I think that's just the reality of it. There's Celebrini is a player who take nothing away from him. I think, but we're already looking at next year where you start to wonder is like okay, is a James Hagens who's probably going to be the number one pick the following year playing for the under eighteen program. Is he if he was available this year, would he go number one? Maybe. So that's the mm-hmm. so I, I think it's not a knock on Celebrini. I think he's gonna be a tremendous player. He may win the Hobie Baker this in two weeks or whatever, whenever they announce it. Um, but I think it's just more reflective of that's how good Connor Bedard is. And that's <laughs> something you guys obviously have seen firsthand. Yeah. That's what he's doing right now, even coming off the injury and, and all of that. Like there's 
that there's naturally going to be that that large of a gap. I think that's more of it's more of that nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lev Shunov is a guy that we've talked a lot about. Mm-hmm. If we yeah. have like the Hawks get number two, yeah. that's I think we've kind of all agreed last week. That's yeah. the guy we want. Just yeah, and, and, skill set. And, and, and he and he's the and he's he's the guy. As I said, I've seen him play a lot in person. I'm based in the Detroit area, so I've seen him play in person multiple times. Um, it's it's probably either him or you look at Ivan Demidov, who's having a tremendous year in Russia. Now it's hard for me because all of my viewings of Demidov have been through video streams, right, and you couldn't true. see him. You couldn't see him in World Junior. It's very similar. What happened with the reason Matvey Michkov went all the way to seven with Philly last year was because we're not really sure how do we evaluate this guy who's playing basically behind a curtain right now, where and they can't and we can't see him against his peers, and that's another kind of big thing that's uh, it's one of the reasons that I actually really like Levshenyov is because even though he is technically a Belarusian player and couldn't do World Junior, by going the college hockey route, we got to see him kind of against grown men, against 23, 24-year-olds, and he's a, like, if you end up with him and you're looking to build your blue line from there, that's it's it's a good problem to have. And what is the De- Demidov in terms of coming here? That's another, it, like, that's, it, a, yeah, that's, gonna, yeah, same like, as Mitch Kov or sooner? His is a little bit, from my understanding, now it's, I'm not exactly right. certain of it, but from my understanding, it's not as long of a build out the way Mitch Kov's is, right? Like, mm-hmm. Mitch Kov, I believe, is, it's the kind of the three year one at least. And that's kind of the weird thing about Philly's rebuild, where everything with Philly is, you're kind of trying to figure out how do you stick the landing for Mitch Kov's ELC year, right? Mm-hmm. Like, where I think yeah. Demidov is, I, there probably will be complications with that and figure it out, but I don't think it's a as long of a run that we've seen with a Mitch Gov or what we saw with the Kaprizov situation with Minnesota. Uh, Caden Lindstrom is another name that mm-hmm. a lot of our listeners have yeah. fallen on. They see the size. They see the skill. Yeah. They're like, okay, yeah. Bedard's a little undersized. Nazar, Oliver Moore, not the biggest guys. Yeah. Anymore, that's the perfect guy. Where you see him go, like if the Hawks are third mm-hmm. and, you know, it's be- it's between uh, Demidoff and Lindstrom, I mean, who are you taking based on what the Hawks kind of are, are, are looking at? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really good question because it's the, there's, there's a difference between building these lists based off who's yeah. the I, I always, best player. I always like to say there's a difference yeah. between filling a roster and building yeah. a team. Yeah. And... I, I, I'm still of the belief that when you're drafting that high it's the you're just taking best player available that's kind of my personal belief on it I think you're still going at some point you figure out your fits later I think that's that's something where I don't want to it's not the NFL with how long you wait for these kids to project so that being said I to me that's that's a really good one and I don't have the best possible answer because those are two guys that I haven't watched in person up close and everything like that that I'd like I from Talking to a lot of our guys and at EP Rinkside, I think I would probably lean toward Demidov right now based off our conversations with them. But it's to give my pure answer on it, I'd probably give you a much better answer two months from now after going through some video after we get through the Memorial Cup and everything like that and the rest of prospect season. We'll have to put you on. It's a shame. <laughs> well, I, think, I think one thing that has been, to me, really fascinating about this draft class is – how quickly and we saw it yeah. what two years ago with uh with Shane Wright mm-hmm. where he was consensus number one guy in his mm-hmm. class for like two yeah. years and then you get to you get through the 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 spring you get to the combine and then all these questions start coming out of yeah. like well this Shane Wright number one and then he falls to four yeah, yeah, yeah. we're seeing it this year with Cole Eisenman yeah I mean, he's he started like this this draft year, basically, like the number two guy, oh, yeah. and now I've seen people saying like he could go in the teens. So what I, do you attribute that to? I, so I see Eisenman a lot actually. You yeah. talk about seeing guys in person. So Eisenman, someone I have seen a, t- a ton actually because they play the under eighteen team is twenty minutes from my house. So I watch a lot of that team, and I actually back in October. I mean, one of the I wrote a story back in October talking to Eisenman about his potential draft and even used the word presumptive potential guy who could push for number two pick. And it would have been a fun, st- like Iserman, I mean, at the time brought up conversations where, so Iserman and Celebrini are actually best friends. Oh. Um, oh. They're, they're, they're best friends. They've, they're both uh, um, allegedly if Celebrini doesn't go pro, which I highly doubt if he, but if Celebrini is still at BU next year, him and Iserman plan to be roommates at BU actually. Oh my gosh. Um, and they, uh, <laughs> and so, 
but they they had talked earlier in the year talked about it's like oh these are two guys who are best friends who could potentially go one and two and that that talk is completely gone now and Iserman to me is you look at him and he is already he already has an NHL shot he's got a he's going to score a lot of goals in the league he's going to be able to shoot and score from distance which is obviously not it's 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 it's, it's a rare talent even even in the NHL but he just disappears at times. Like there'll be times where you'll go and there's probably about a three, four month stretch where you would go to games. And it was very like peak at a junior hockey level and very like peak Brett Hull esque where it's like you would watch Brett Hull play and you'd be like, you forgot Brett Hull was in the game <laughs> for, and then, and then all of a sudden he scores a goal with like five minutes left. And you're like, Oh, that's why, that's why everyone cares. And, that's what Iserman has been like for me at the junior level. Now, he's been more active and noticeable in the last, it was in February, like, 8th through 15th or whatever. Like, there was the Four Nations tournament uh, or Five Nations tournament in Plymouth where um, that, for me, was kind of where I started to see more from Iserman as far as being more of a 200-foot player, getting being a little bit, having, taking better routes, um, being more physical, and I started to see more of that. I think he's the type of guy who's probably going to fall to the 10, 12 range, and some team's going to be three. And he's and that's actually probably going to be the best fit for him because he's going to go somewhere where he doesn't have to be the building block, and he can go somewhere and just be the shooter on someone's wing. And he can go somewhere. Like, I think for the kid, it's going to be one of those humbling things in Vegas on in, in June when, oh, start of the year everyone thought you were going to go too and all of a sudden you're not going to pick till 10 12 but maybe in the long run he'll end up with one of those teams where we just add the goal scorer that we can put on the wing the guy yeah. who can do this and i think that's that's kind of the, going to be the case with eisenman because he's a he's a he really is an interesting prospect to go from the way he's gone from if you look at the lists the start of year everyone oh it was celebrini eisenman and then everyone pretty much had him one too and now it's he's not even in the conversation for top five yeah Sounds a little like you're describing uh, our old friend Alex DeBrinkett a little bit there, like mm-hmm. very similar. Yeah. Like one, I mean, if you are going to be a quote one trick pony in hockey, I guess scoring goals is the best one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's a good trick. It's a good trick to have. It's a good trick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that, that 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 sounds right about where the Hawks and uh, have that Tampa pick. <laughs> Well, that's true. I, I mean, yeah. Depending on what happens. I mean, it worked it's last year. It's not a zero percent chance. Yeah. Oliver Moore kept <laughs> yep. slipping and slipping. I mean, yep. uh, Kyle Davidson was famously trying to trade up to get him, and yep. then he falls him in 19. Uh, that's an interesting pick because obviously we don't know where it is yet. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, we, we hear a lot of names thrown out there. Uh, have, you, have you seen uh, the the younger Aginia, Ginla play? That's a name a yeah. lot of people – Ask about because yeah. Yeah. obviously the name recognition, yeah. but it's a talent, a lot of talent there too. Yeah, I mean he's a guy. No, I, I I haven't seen him play in person yet, but I've seen him on much better cameras than I've seen from Russia. <laughs> so it's the, <laughs> so I feel like I, I, I feel like I have a slightly better view, feel on him than I do honestly of of Demidov and everything like that. I also have a better feel for what the WH WHL is, and I mean he's a guy who if you can get him with that Tampa pick range and everything like that. I'd, He's a guy who have a hard time seeing go past 10, especially with how much hockey we care about pedigree and name recognition too, where he's a player where he would be a top 15 pick no matter what based off his reputation. But I think it's one of those where the last name and sometimes like that where is that the issue, is that the, when someone's at that draft table and they're making a pick between A and B is, well, when the last name's Aginla, that might be the mm-hmm. reason you, yeah. <laughs> you pick one over the other. Yeah. So, Well, you know, in hockey, having affluent parents is a good thing. So yes. We, yes. We, we learned that, yes. this, so we we learned learned that this week. Yes. Um, yes. Future 50 goal scorer. Yes, I mean, uh, I mean uh, we're all talking about uh, the guy who kept hockey in Arizona, basically. His son scoring two goals last night, right? That's, yes. that's the one we're talking yes. about, yes. right? Also, also <laughs> that one, too. Um, too. I did want to ask, uh, you know, let, let's say the that Tampa, you know, gets in the playoffs, makes a run, so that pick ends up later in the first yeah. round than, you know, in mm-hmm. the in yeah. the late teens or anything like that. One guy that, that I've peripherally kind of looked into a little bit more uh, that I think is kind of around that late first, early second round range, what's your take on defenseman EJ Emery with the, the U.S. program? Yeah, he's um, – I actually spoke with him about a month ago, and he, I think he's, he's kind of going to fit that. We don't have many – 
Like we need to, as an industry and as hockey coverage, we need to come up with a better definition for what we call the guy who is defensively solid because stay at home is such a outdated term and everything like that. But he's to me, he's very, I think as a pro, he kind of is that settle down, becomes that settle the game equivalent of what a stay at home defenseman is. He can skate, he can move the puck, he makes good outlet passes, but he's not going to be a guy who's going to put up many points from the blue line. He's not going to be a guy, especially at the pro level, who's going to be much more than a stabilizer. But I think stabilizing, is that's that's something that you need. You need the, with all of the skill guys, you need you need someone who can stabilize things. You need someone who can do that. And I, I like Emery. I think he's, if you can get him late first round, early second, it's probably, it's probably pretty good value for him. And um, he's also a guy who I thought was pretty good at the Five Nations recently, and it'll be interesting too. He's another guy where one of the big, like, with that, that under-18 team, their schedule's always kind of, it's hard to truly figure out which data points to use as the best. Because mm-hmm. they play such a, it's cool, but they also play a hybrid schedule, right? Where mm-hmm. they play about seven or eight college hockey games. They play in the USHL. They play these international games. And for me, Emery has been one of those guys who, I thought he was really good when I've seen him some of the Five Nations, but... I've also seen him in USHL games, and it's been – I haven't seen – I expected more, right? Mm-hmm. And so he's, he's an interesting guy to me that I would be fascinated to see which – what path a team goes with him because I do think he's one of those guys who will really benefit from going, being able to have those two, three years of college hockey to add more to that. Yeah. we got to take one more break. want to remind everybody that March Madness is upon us. Watch the big dance live at Salerno's on tap – located at 1201 West Grand in Chicago, or call them for carryout and delivery. Mention CHGO and get half off your pizza. Call 312-666-3444 or go to salernospizza.com. We're going to do that tomorrow night. Tomorrow night? Decision made, yes. And Saturday And Saturday. And Saturday. All right, sure. That's fine. You, fine. you talked me into it. Oh, no. Pizza <laughs> twice in pizza. Oh, pizza no. Pizza for dinner two I've out of three nights. I've never done that before. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Twist my arm, why don't you? And hey, while you're getting uh, half off your pizza, why don't you just go on and become a diehard with us here at CHGO. Join the CHGO sports community and get the most access and the best perks and just be part of uh, part of what we're doing here. Uh, go to allchgo.com, click on that diehard tab. Uh, you get access to all of our uh, written uh, content that is uh, behind that diehard only access. You get access to the diehards only discord you get 20 yep. percent off of all of our merch at the chgo locker all of our events we just had uh our chgo blackhawks takeover last night uh blackhawks beating the calgary flames so we're three oh and one in takeovers you could be there too part of the uh the winning culture maybe, maybe you'll get on the uh maybe you'll get on too. the jumbotron <laughs> if, if, if greg will uh let you have the spotlight for a little uh, bit probably not <laughs> um kind of and then thing. yeah when you sign up to be a diehard you get uh, a free shirt or hat upon sign up uh and uh, every year at renewal you get that for free and speaking of our events mlb opening weekend is coming up uh, we got the CHGO Sox home opener at the Ballpark Pub and the away uh, opener, season opener for the Cubs. That's going to be at the Country Club. So head over to our events page at allchgo.com for all those upcoming events and details. And uh, the more you support us, the more we can do stuff like this. That's right. Opening day is tomorrow. It's crazy. Oh, you I'm got excited. the shirt for it. Yeah, right. I love that shirt. It's a good that shirt. is good. I yeah. like that. It's a good, good one. shirt. I'm talking that shirt up. It looks good. It's the only problem with your shirts is sometimes during the show, I'm just like. <laughs> you get mesmerized. Getting mem- mesmerized by the design. <laughs> sure, like, what? Shirts. What are you're we like, talking about? <laughs> you're like George Costanza. That's only half of it, you know, of course. <laughs> you're like George Costanza with the uh, the 3D picture. Yeah, and right. You forget I, can't, to we, I was just talking to my daughter about those. I can't do those. No, I'm, I'm I've never been able too. to do one in my life. It's very frustrating. Yeah. You're, relax your eyes. Look through it. Nothing. No. It's a schooner. Can't do it. <laughs> when do I get to see the goddamn sailboat? Uh, all right, we've talked a lot about potential yep. Blackhawks. Let's yep. talk about actual Blackhawks. Yep. Um, we've been talking a lot about Frank Nazar, Oliver yeah. Moore, Sam Renzel. Yeah. Of the guys who we've not seen at the NHL level yet, who excites you? Who stands out? Who do you think is like kind of a guaranteed stud, if any of them? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I watch a lot of that Michigan team, too. So I've seen seen Nazar quite a bit, obviously, and he's got a uh, – you never like his injury, like, 
you never want to be at a spot where that's something that's made him go back to college for another year. But I think he is a guy who getting that extra year at Michigan, kind of the pushback of, and then after Bedard, like he kind of, I talked earlier about Iserman probably going to a spot where he's going to be able to go somewhere where it's going to be a great atmosphere where he's not going to have to be the face and carry everything. So I think Nazer really benefited from, he's going to be able to be just part of the long-term plan. And I think that's going to be, that, that, that's, that's going to be a really good thing. And he's someone who, um, he can really dominate, like watching him. I see, I saw him play at Michigan three or four times live this year, um, including um, you look at, like there was a game that they played, Michigan and Michigan State played at in Detroit about a month, month back, and it was one of those games where you watch him play and you can see how he controls a game, even though, I mean, Trey Augustine basically stole that game for Michigan State, but it was a, it was a space where you could see Nazer's impact. The guy that is actually – really interesting to me from a Blackhawks perspective. And it's not necessarily a lock, but it just because he's a fascinating individual and I'm curious to see where it goes is I talked about at some point you got to find your goalie, right? And I think Adam Guyan is actually a really interesting player because he's a guy who, A, the backstory is great. For people who don't know, and I wrote about this on, at, at EP Rinkside, but Guyan basically was playing back in Europe, didn't really have many, many opportunities, and he would literally take... A go set, take his own go, take his own GoPro, set it up behind his net, and cut his own clips <laughs> and and like iMovie and send them and send them and send them out and so hire him. and that's uh, <laughs> and uh, we and, need and, a clip guy here. yeah and that's and that's how he ended up go, getting just just getting the um, NAHL opportunity and then now is playing in the USHL for two years and is going to go to Duluth um, next year and he's a guy who I find from a goaltending perspective fascinated because. He's a little bit, he's taken a slight, he's not a robot, right? Like there's a lot of, goaltending is very robotic right now. A lot of the reason that we, like save percentage in the NHL is what, 0.903 right now. It's like the last, this year and last year, the lowest it's been since the first year out of the lockout. A lot of that I think is because goalies are so robotic where shooters have evolved and now it's like, oh, if I'm going to shoot high glove, I know what everyone does high glove. Guyan is not completely robotic. I think he's, very, uh, I think he has, there's there's going to be a learning curve with that. I think there's some pro tendencies he has to pick up. But I think from the base set, it's not turning a robot into an athlete. And it's refining an athlete with guy and goal. And I think mm-hmm. that, to me, he's a really interesting prospect to watch. Because you have Bedard. You've got your number one center for 20 years. You've got, you're, you're going to, you're, you're building at some point, I think just with goaltending, and I know we we're getting more and more of a 1A, 1B league, but I still think you need that 1A, and I think four or five years from now, that may be, be – see where that plays out with him. That so would be was, awesome. It was an interesting pick when it happened because yeah. it was the first of three in the second yep. round, and yeah. the Hawks are high on Drew Camezzo, who mm-hmm. was having a pretty good first pro year yeah. in Rockford. But So it was kind of like, oh, okay, interesting, but – you can never have too much goaltending. Well, you, you're you're, you're going to need both, right? Yeah. Like, you're, you're, you're going to need both. Yeah, like you, look, you look at Vegas yeah. last year and how many goalies and, and, they and, used. And, 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 in today's NHL, it's, let's see, there's probably four or five guys, and that's about it, who are like, oh, right. that's a legit yeah. number one in the old school style of the number one. And I'm a big believer that with goaltending now, you need to win a Stanley Cup. You need your goalie to be able to play 75 games. That means 25 playoff games. Mm-hmm. So you need your, you're going to need a guy, you're going to need – your one B to be a thirty game guy. Just that's the with how demanding the position is, how physical it is now. On we see more hip injuries, we see more we see more injuries like that that we never saw because of this post integration stuff that goalies are doing. And so you're gonna need if you can have Mizzo and Gian, it doesn't matter who's if you can in your long term build, if that can be your tandem, you're in a really good spot. Yeah, I've yeah. compared the goalies in the NHL now to the way you know, especially for fantasy football players, how the running back position yep. evolved over the last 10 years mm-hmm. or so, whether yep. it's by committee. And, yeah. you know, if you're lucky to get that one of those three number one backs in your fantasy league, then you're set. Mm-hmm. Uh, goaltending has kind of gone the same route. Well, it, we've even we've even seen it happen. Like, everyone still looks at Andre Vasilevsky as, okay, best best goalie in the world. He still comes up all the time in that conversation. And, and it's not that it's not a wrong thing, but you we've seen the wear and tear of what Tampa's Playoff runs. We've seen this year he dealt with the injury. We've seen him look human at times. Now I'm not. He's not a guy I technically 
would say I, I count against or anything like that, but we've seen how it happens. We saw Connor Hellebuck last year in the in Hellebuck in that Vegas series last year. He looked, all, I mean, now Vegas rocked Winnipeg throughout that series, but Hellebuck looked like he was finally feeling the wear and tear of playing all those yeah. minutes. It's it's a position where if you aren't managing your minutes better now in load managing, and I know hockey people really don't like that word because it's <laughs> because it's yeah. it's against the ethos of everything. Everyone plays through everything, but if you're not doing it with your goaltending, I, I, I think Vegas lucked into kind of setting the, the stage last year with it with, because of the injuries with I mean, at least three goalies in the playoffs last year. So. <laughs> insane. So, yeah. yeah, and you know, you saw two years ago, you could have said the same thing with. Uh, Shesterkin in the Rangers. He yep. was the greatest, you know, he was a heart trophy finalist and he wore down and he wore down a bit last year and now they kind of learned yeah. their lesson and yeah. they and got quick who's taken a lot and of And that minutes. was one of the big things, right? Where when he was kind of trying to dig his way out of it and everything, they let quick run with it. And I think there's part of that where um, who knows whether Jack Campbell's going to ever figure things out. But like, I think one of the mistakes the Oilers made was they sent Jack Campbell to actually go play in the AHL right now. Like the whole Toronto situation where goalie was struggling and instead of sending him to play, they basically let him mentally right. reset. And I think that's something you need to have more of with that position. I, like I was, I was talking to my, uh, my pal Dmitry Filipovich about it the other day. Like there's something that I really love what Carolina is doing right now where when Spencer Martin is basically the, the backup. He's not one like you have uh, Kachekov and um, and uh, and Anderson right now. One starts, Martin backs up. The other guy is is getting the full night off. Like I think this is where we're going to keep going further with the goaltending position, and I think it's going to make for better goaltending because at some point, it's like a giant pendulum, right? Like shooters, it was we went from an area where there was no goals being scored to now. Everyone's scoring, and I think at some Sam point, the, I think 50. I think the pendulum is going <laughs> to start to swing back a little bit as people look at goaltending and react to why and how guys have been handled. Yeah, yeah we saw that a little bit this year with the Hawks. Arvid Soderbrom, the mm -hmm. backup, yeah. was struggling big yeah. time, mm -hmm. and it's debatable if he's ever like come out of that funk. Yeah, yeah. But instead of sending him to Rockford to play, they just extra time with Jimmy Waite, mm -hmm. and we're just going to skip a couple of your starts yeah. here and. Yep. It worked to a degree for a little bit, but I think it's just yeah. a, a talent issue there at this point. Well, great stuff. That is Sean Shapiro from EP Rinkside. He's got a uh, sub stack called Shep Shots. Check that out. Uh, he also plays Nick in the Late Game movie, which is available to rent or buy right now on Amazon Prime Video. Go to lategame.com slash Chicago for a $30 Wolves ticket plus a movie ticket for tonight or Friday. Awesome, man. Thanks for being here. Yeah, it's fun. Thanks for having me, guys. Make sure you're following Sean on Twitter, by the way, at Sean Shapiro. We are back tomorrow. We got pregame. 530? 530. 530. 530 pregame. 530 pregame. Hawks and Sens. We'll be eating Salernos. That's for damn sure. So we'll talk to you then. Thanks for watching the CHGO Blackhawks podcast. We all silly like the mayor. 